Good afternoon. Attorney Protective would like to welcome you to today's webinar, The Brave New World of AI, The Risks to Lawyers. Please reference your materials for information about today's speakers, Dana Herlich and David Atkins. And with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, David. Hello, everyone out there. Uh, thank you to AtPro for asking us to speak on this topic of risks involved with lawyers using AI. So what we'll touch on today are the items you see before you. And when I say touch, I mean we, it will be a summary at a very high level of what the, of the risks that companies like Attorney Protective and other professional liability carriers are seeing and continue to see. We'll talk about some of the risks, and we'll also talk about internal policies for law practices and law firms to consider in dealing with this. The disclaimer that has to be noted here is that <clears throat> the world of AI, <clears throat> as many people know, is rapidly, and I mean rapidly, day by day, changing and expanding. The vendors and service providers who market to law firms specifically is expanding day by day. And many of you may have investigated, many of you may have been solicited by AI service providers. And so that the variations in the services provided are something that is evolving day by day and really is something that's hard to capture in a presentation like this. Next slide, please. So we'll cover these basic topics and some of the risks that AI has triggered for law firms. Next slide. So this is just a smattering of some of the players who are marketing specifically to lawyers or at least include in their AI platforms programs that they're marketing to lawyers. Next slide, please. The way to think about generative artificial intelligence is not to assume it stands for guaranteed attorney incompetence, as some of the press reports have suggested, but instead think of it as a tool, a technological tool that has the potential to assist us in our law practices, has the potential to make law practice more efficient, but comes with certain risks, not unlike any new technology that lawyers integrate into their practice. Think of cloud computing. Think of different programs that analyze today ESI and vast amounts of electronic discovery, many of which have traditionally incorporated AI features. But what's developed in kind of an explosive way so quickly in the last 18 months are advances in what AI can do. The way that I think about it is it's not a retrieval service like an electronic reference librarian that goes and retrieves existing items or publications. Think of Westlaw or LexisNexis. Instead, it has much more of a human-like interpretive function in retrieving the data in response to specific queries. And that makes it potentially very, very useful, but at the same time poses certain risks that lawyers have to be aware of. The mystery, of course, is we don't quite know how it works, and that leads to some potential for uncertainty for any law firm that buys an AI program and begins using it to service clients. Advantages are obvious. It has the advantage, it has the potential to improve efficiency in providing services to our clients, particularly for what I would call commoditized tasks, purchase and sale agreements, loan documents, leases, M&A deals that require analyzing vast amounts of data as part of due diligence, even things like demand letters can be done um, with suggestions uh, from 
um, an AI program, demand letters, things like maybe even prenuptial agreements in domestic relations cases. Certainly on the litigation side, the AI vendors are actively touting the advantages for discovery and analysis of vast of uh, electronic information that's provided in, as part of discovery in assisting the compiling and retrieving massive amounts of ESI, but with more but with uh, something different than we've traditionally gotten from ESI vendors, namely this type of interpretive function, which may include summaries, descriptions, and what many of the AI providers call abstracts in describing the data that's being retrieved. A related litigation function that we're seeing marketed to law firms is searching the record transcripts and discovery documents for the specific purpose of plugging in those that information as citations into briefs. The result of this, all this, among other things, is obvious. We're going to see, probably, most experts think, a rapid, a dramatic shift in the uh, uh, staffing needs of lawyers, as many of these tasks I've just described are obviously tasks that were traditionally performed by paralegals or more recent uh, law graduates. So that's going to be one obvious thing to look for as AI becomes more widespread. The cost maybe will be made up and absorbed by firms as they reduce their labor costs. Now I'll turn it over to Dana to talk about the risks of mistakes and unreliable results. Good morning uh, or good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here with David discussing this really important and cutting edge topic. Um, we've all heard the horror stories, and so the title to this slide is Risk inaccurate and unreliable results. So what could go wrong? Um, I think we've seen a lot can go wrong with artificial intelligence. Um, and the programs that offer um, AI services now are recognizing this. And so you'll see if you log on to some of these programs that they're starting with their own disclaimers. So we've provided an example of one in the slide. Um, just yesterday, I logged into ChatGPT and there is a pop-up right when you start up and it says while we have safeguards chat gpt may give you inaccurate information it's not intended to give you advice so chat gpt has its own lawyers who drafted that language um, and they recognize that because it is generated information built internally on whatever the output depends on whatever the input is along the way that the information you could get could be unreliable um, so the question, do lawyers really need to rely on output that does not accurately reflect real facts? Well, um, would you like to rely in servicing your clients on inaccurate output? I think the answer is no, you don't want to do that. So a lot could go wrong here. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So the danger, of course, is that um, there are really many times no red flags when you get information from AI programs uh, that say this is wrong, this is inaccurate. Um, sometimes, a lot of times, the output that you're receiving looks identical to, it looks accurate. It comes out like it's a fact. It's very confidently broadcast to you um, and outputted, and it looks right. So the danger is that you may not have any idea that what you are reading and the output that you received based on the question you inputted or the sample you've asked for or the data you've requested, uh, you have absolutely no idea that it could have been created out of thin air by the program itself and the way that it was, um, that it was trained and built. So you have to approach your use of AI programs very cautiously and don't be fooled um, or lulled into a sense of false confidence that because you're reading something that looks like it's true, um, it must be true. That's not necessarily the case. Even if you are receiving output that is uh, coming to you in voluminous quantities, and we mentioned this on the slide, you will need to vet it. If you use AI, you need to consider 
incorporating and creating new processes in your practice by which to cite and fact check it for accuracy. There always needs to be some level of attorney oversight of your use of AI. Next slide, please. Thank you. So some of you may have heard of this term, some perhaps not. Uh, the question, what is an AI hallucination? We've provided the Wikipedia version here, but the simple answer to what an AI hallucination is, is it's just an incorrect or misleading result that an AI model generates that's presented as a fact. It can be caused by many different factors, including insufficient training data, insufficient assumptions made by the AI model, or biases in the data that are used to train the model. An analogy that I would like to use is it's sometimes, or it, it's, it's like how sometimes uh, humans will see, if you look up into the sky at night and you see the moon, and it looks like you see a face in the moon, there's really no face in the moon, but it looks like it. And you might say, oh, look, there's a face in the moon. It's kind of the same thing. It's a misinterpretation of something presented as a fact. So various examples of, um, of AI hallucinations include um, Google's BARD chatbot, this is just an example, incorrectly claimed that the James Webb Space Telescope had captured the world's first image of a planet outside our solar system. It very confidently <laughs> stated that, and it was 100% um, false. That is not what happened, but uh, that's just a fact. Microsoft Chat AI Sydney um, admitted in the beginning to falling in love with its users. Um, we know that that didn't happen, but it was very confident that it was falling in love. And, and so these are, um, these are just not true. They're misleading results. They look a whole lot like facts, and they're created based on the training, uh, the training models that are used to generate the AI. Um, we say at the end here, at, at the bottom of the slide, chat GPT is an omniscient, eager to please intern who sometimes lies to you. Um, I think that that's, that's true of AI. I would say that maybe the, um, the more accurate way of saying it is it's an omniscient, eager to please inter intern who sometimes lies to you without knowing it's lying, and so it presents it as true. Um, that's, of course, the inherent danger in the information that is being outputted from these models. Next slide. Thank you. And I, uh, David, actually, I'm going to give you credit for this. <laughs> but this is uh, Hal 9000, from the fiction, who's a fictional AI character from uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey from 1969. And, and of course, he was a pleaser and ultimately the bad guy in that, in that movie. But um, he was essentially saying what he was, uh, what it was programmed as output. Um, his, his, he was doing the best he could with what he was allowed to output at the same time with what he was not allowed to output. And so uh, the moral of that story was he, everything that he did, everything that he was uh, trained to do as an AI bot in that movie um, was really to please the people that were asking him for information. Um, and it's scary that in 1969, they were able to create this fictional character that looks a whole lot like the generative AI models that are being used today. So just a little fun um, tidbit and go watch the movie. It's really great. <laughs> um, next slide, please. So the question, is generative AI the right tool for the job? And we have a little funny quote here, right? Don't use a calculator to try to determine whether you've spelled a word correctly. If you do that, don't blame the calculator because you are the problem. Think carefully about what you are trying to do and why you're trying to do it. Is using AI the best answer? What other tools are at your disposal? I want to be clear that my, David and I together, I think I'll speak for both of us here, we're not anti-artificial intelligence. It's certainly, using GAI can be a very useful tool in your practice. But you have to be careful about it. You have to be thoughtful and intentional about how you're using it and, uh, and really how you're overseeing it and incorporating it into your practice because careless uses of it have led to less desirable results, uh, many times results that are being made public, and I'm sure you've all heard of them. So next slide, please. So the next couple slides just address some of what has been going on around the country, uh, various cases involving attorneys in litigation who are 
using GAI platforms to write briefs, to write motions, to provide them with accurate citations for cases that they need to cite. Um, and as we've discussed, as AI might do, it is confidently spewing out information that is um, simply made up. And in many, if not most of these cases, the attorneys have not taken the care or the time to review the output from the GAI system, and they've just verbatim plopped it in. Um, and so what we're seeing as a result is um, courts have responded with a little bit of judicial hysteria because we, I mean, admittedly, we've never, anyone, no one here has seen something like this before. And so the immediate reaction was somewhat, uh, it was somewhat brash and it, and it was fast, right? It was, let's sanction them, let's hold a hearing, let's see what happened, how could you have done this? Um, and courts are routinely now across the country implementing um, standing protective orders and standing rules that, uh, for their courtrooms that concern attorneys' obligations and responsibilities when using, potentially using, AI in the practice before that court. Um, and they're requiring, in some instances, attorneys to sign as a part of the certification when they uh, file motions and they file briefs that they have, if they've used AI, they've used it responsibly and they've double and triple checked their sites and they understand that they are they alone are responsible. The signing person, the undersigned, is responsible for the content, including the citations and the substance of what they're presenting to the court. Um, and as you know, we are all attorneys. We have a duty of candor um, and we cannot lie to the court. We cannot present inaccurate or false statements of law. So it's very important um, and judges recognizing that have created these types of, of orders and certifications. Um, I think there's two takeaways from this. The first takeaway uh, is fairly simple, I think. You know, this is not the first time that something groundbreaking, um, cutting edge has come before the court. Um, and so w society and the legal practice will, will evolve. Um, as courts become more familiar with attorneys' use of AI, as attorneys become more familiar and familiar with, um, or sorry, more familiar and uh, I guess more competent <laughs> is the right word to use, um, at using these GAI, GAI models, um, I think we'll see more flexible standing orders. I think we'll see um, more flexible receptions by the court in uh, in understanding people's use of these programs. Um, so I think the way we'll see people react and courts react moving forward will evolve as the technology evol evolves, as um, attorneys and their practices evolve. But the other point is that we're not, you know, while how we practice and how we research and how we, um, you know, type in inputs to receive an output that's useful, while that has changed, the, the rules of ethics have not changed. So we're dealing with the same rules that we've always had, and we're just trying to adapt them to these new technologies that we're using in our practices. And like I said, this is not the first time that'll happen. It's probably not the last time that it'll happen. And so it's just important to keep an eye out. And I think various states across the country are, um, are really exploring the bounds of what this means. Uh, and taking these, you know, age-old rules and applying them in this cutting-edge way. So I actually would uh, refer people to, if you Google it, you should be able to find it pretty easily, but um, there's a Florida bar ethics opinion um, from January 19, 2024. So call it a month and two days ago. Um, it's an advisory ethics opinion, but it very thoroughly runs through the relevant implicated rules of ethics uh, and how, at least in Florida, the court is suggesting that, um, that attorneys use AI in, in an ethical and competent way. Um, it, it's really a great opinion, and I would uh, suggest maybe a model for how many, um, many other states moving forward will use it, but I, I think it's a really useful, it's a, it's a useful resource right now. So um, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, solving the problem of AI hallucinations. I want to preface this by saying I'm not sure this is a problem that we as the users of AI can solve um, because these hallucinations are created by 
how AI models are trained in answering questions, right? Um, the programs, the, um, the training models, the information that's inputted by the programmers largely create how these programs process de uh, data and how they output and what they output there. Um, but you'll see that, uh, that at least several programs have tweaked their tools based on what has happened recently um, with legal research uh, results and court results in these cases. So for example, um, actually in preparing for this presentation, I opened up ChatGPT and I, I typed in a single prompt. I said, can you find a federal case overturning Roe versus Wade? And of course I'm referring to, in my mind, the Dobbs decision, which was released in June of, of 2023. Uh, sorry, June of 2022. 2023. I don't even know what year it is anymore anyway. But um, the important part is that ChatGPT's immediate response was that as of my last update in January 2022, there has not been a federal case that directly overturns Roe versus Wade. Um, however, it's essential to note that the legal landscape is subject to change and new cases may have emerged since then. Um, that's very interesting because it did not try to give me the answer and it admitted, hey, I'm not going to give you that answer. So it has been programmed specifically not to provide um, legal information or legal research advice uh, since its update in January 22, or, uh, 2022. So it did not provide me with the Dobbs case. Um, this really points to the ultimate solution to hallucinations, or at least the best we're going to get right now, which is that there has to be human oversight. You cannot rely on artificial intelligence, whether it's ChatGPT or some other AI input-output model, or whether it's the type of AI that's embedded in certain programs that we use every day. For example, you know, I know Microsoft has uh, Microsoft Copilot has a program that integrates into 365 and it can, I mean, literally like read your chats and give you summaries of emails and, and clear out your inbox. It can draft letters and emails. I mean, the kinds of things it can do is crazy, but you can't rely on AI to do your job. Um, you have to do your job. And even if that means, you know, you use it to create a first draft of something, you have to understand it can never be the final draft. So you have to always review it. You always have to check it for factual accuracies, for legal like citations accuracies. You have to make sure that what it's saying is correct because it so frequently and quite scarily uh, will create these hallucinations which look a whole lot like they're the truth, but they're not. And the only way you can know that is through human oversight. So I will turn it over to David for the next slide. So one of the common risks that the risk managers in the law firms and the ethics advisory authors, such as the ones in Florida, have pointed to have to do with confidentiality. This is a concern that is not limited to the AI platforms because we went through this when, for example, there was an expansion in cloud computing and cloud storage. With respect to AI, two principal concerns have emerged. One has to do with the question of the use to which the inputted information is made. To the extent that you provide a query to an AI platform that directly or indirectly, indirectly identifies your client, you're running the risk of breaching your obligations of confidentiality if, number one, you don't have the client's consent, which has to be number one. Again, this is similar to the debate about the safeguards for cloud computing and cloud storage. But secondly, you have to make sure that the vendor provides some safeguards for the way in which the information will be used. So one episode, again, with the unfortunate open AI company that uh, took so much abuse because of the mishaps in 
uh, fabricated citations in these high-profile decisions Dana referred to also took heat when it had to announce that it had a bug that allowed certain users to see titles of chat prompts submitted by other prior uh, customers, unrelated customers, and sometimes it included information with uh, personal identifying data as well, highly sensitive information. Next slide. Well, no, hold on one second. Go back, please, sorry. The um, second has, so that's the question of um, the use to which information, potentially identifiable client information that is given to a service provider sort of stays on the system, but it's not just a matter of staying in the vendor's system. It's a matter of the data actually being used somehow to analyze unrelated questions that come from unrelated users of the technology. There's a form of AI that's called self-learning, and um, a self-learning generative AI program, by definition, as I understand it, continually refines its responses to inquiries, and as part of what it does is it, it uh, it integrates responses that it um, gave to earlier inquirers. That obviously poses a risk of breaching confidentiality duties. The second I alluded to earlier is just general storage um, safeguards that you, that vendors need to, uh, that lawyers need to make, have get some assurance that the vendors are properly safeguarding information that, again, could be deemed to directly or indirectly disclose client information. So those are the main things that the risk managers are telling us we have to be concerned, and this obviously goes to the question of due diligence and shopping and the questions the lawyers will definitely need to pose to AI vendors. I'll now turn it over to Dana. So on the topic of, of risks that you may not have considered initially, um, IP infringement is right up there. Um, so for example, we've provided here, ChatGPT's terms of use, uh, under their terms of use, OpenAI assigns to each user all intellectual, proper, intellectual property rights that the program spits out in response to the user's prompt in which the company may have rights. But what about the content created um, what about the training data that goes in? So AI generates outputs largely because its programmers have exposed those systems to vast quantities of things like visual images, text, or other information, and that's what they've dubbed as to be, quote, training data. Many images and texts dubbed to be tra training data are copyrightable. Um, if you typed something into chat GPT right now, tell me about X, um, AI, chat GPT is going to look through everything it knows about X and tell you about it, and a lot of that informi information likely came from copyrightable uh, text and copyrightable images. So there's a lot of litigation ongoing right now over whether the use of such content to train the AI tools um, in the output it's itself, whether that constitutes copyright infringement. Um, we don't really have solid answers yet. We know that because, like, I've, you know, the general theme here is this is cutting edge. We're sort of learning as we go. Congress um, and the courts are really going to be left to be the ones who figure out the guidelines and the parameters around ownership and the use of AI-generated materials. But what we know right now is that it is um, – I would say very likely, if not it always happened, <laughs> that there's some type of IP infringement happening when you are typing in a question and receiving information from a GAI model. Here we get to some of the protocols and policies that claims people and risk and loss prevention people have been recommending law firms consider when they look into 
contracting with a AI vendor. Certainly, from a tech, tech standpoint, no firm should ever consider installing on its own system any of the applications or software programs that a vendor is offering without some significant due diligence by the IT professionals. The risks being exposure of client information and even infection via malware. So that's really sort of a basic step that a firm needs to consider. Next slide, please. Assuming that the firm approves on a trial basis or a more permanent basis some form of AI tool for use by its lawyers, then care has to be given, given everything that we've discussed today, to the users. What exactly are your lawyers going to, what tasks do they intend to use the AI tool for? What projects do they, are they considering using it for? And really providing, if they go outside the, what the firm has uh, authorized as its AI vendor, certainly there has to be some assurance that of both the accuracy of the information, and that requires the kind of due diligence that Dana was suggesting about the track record of the vendor in question the potential for accuracies, et cetera, et cetera. Certainly, the terms and conditions of any contract, service contract with an AI provider, have to be thoroughly analyzed. And again, I would analogize this to outside service providers in cloud storage, outside service providers for electronic discovery uh, review, any kind of outside vendor to whom client information is inevitably, as part of the task, going to be provided has to be, um, has to give assurances to the law firm. Certainly, uh, outside vendors who ask for indemnification for any injury uh, it causes is going to raise a red flag and is something that should be avoided, push, certainly pushed back for or even rejected in favor of a different vendor. If, to the extent the AI provider um, wants a license um, agreement, that also has to be carefully analyzed. Next slide, please. We want to take some time to really, in addition to analyzing the risks and benefits of the vendor and its product, Correspondingly, we want to make sure that our own firm personnel are sophisticated and competent enough to use the tool. Um, and so many firms now are really, do have a formal approval process, which is done sort of on a case-by-case -case basis. And then, of course, in, with respect to the vendor, does the vendor have adequate security features to safeguard client information? Is there the risk, as we discussed earlier, with the self-learning programs that client-related information provided by the firm will somehow wind up being revealed to a different customer of the vendor? And the point that Dana alluded to, too, the use of client-related information provided by the firm to the vendor being used as part of the built-in training process of the AI tool in responding to prompts or queries from other customers. Next slide. Ah, so Here's a hypothetical that we wanted to pose to the audience with some multiple choice responses. I have to say this is not something I have personally seen. We've heard, um, and this is on the subject of clients' response to the AI revolution. Will clients 
want their law firms to utilize AI based on an expectation of efficiency and reduced cost. Conversely, will firms fearful of the kind of risks that Dana described before of inaccuracy, of bogus citations, of fabricated reliance on fabricated information go the opposite way and actually prohibit their law firms from using uh, AI. So this hypothetical assumes the former. And again, I have to say I, I haven't seen this yet, but I can imagine there would be tech-savvy clients who would demand the law firm utilize AI in the services provided to the client. So let's assume we have a privately held business which engages the law firm in its uh, plan to acquire another company. So an M&A transaction. And like it has a very young, tech-savvy principal in the company who's calling the shots. And he's read that certain predictive AI tools can review a complicated draft purchase and sale agreement and then rapidly model the impact of earnout scenarios for shareholders of the acquired company. And this is something that is typically done as part of the due diligence process in the acquisition of another company. Why? Because you want to be able, the acquiring company wants to be able to figure out and forecast what certain financial uh, results might have on its obligation to pay out to the share shareholders of the acquired company. And again, this would be the type of M&A task that traditionally would be handled by paralegals or rookie associates. And you can imagine in major, major acquisition deals involving large corporations and publicly publicly owned corporations, those tasks involve many, uh, many law firm employees. In this instance, the client insists that the engagement agreement for this engagement to help the firm make the acquisition of the other company specifically requires the firm to purchase an AI tool, specifically requires the firm to acquire an AI, AI tool offered by an identifiable vendor, G-Wiz Predictive, for the specific purpose of performing, quote, rapid quantitative forecasting of the MAA deal terms. All right, everybody got that? So let's go to the choices for the law firm faced with that request from a potentially very big client and a potentially lucrative client engagement. And here are the choices. The firm should A, flat out reject the client's proposal, B, just agree, sign the agreement and do exactly as the client has requested, counter with the idea that, yeah, we'll do it, but we're going to shift the cost, and so that the cost associated with the AI vendor performing the task the client demands that vendor perform be entirely at the client's cost. D, counter the client's proposal with the proviso, we'll do it, but not in the event the firm's own IT professionals determine the GWIS platform poses risks to the firm's own operating systems. Or E, counter the client's proposal that the firm will explore the benefits and risks of utilizing AI software of its own choosing. So E sort of placates the client and hedges by saying, we'll consider doing it, but we'll only agree to do it uh, with a vendor of our choosing. So this is going to, I think, increasingly be something law firms are faced with. 
and the question will become how to balance clients' demand for cost-effective services against risk that the firm itself will face, both to its own systems, its own operating systems, and to its ability to provide competent representation and, as alluded to before, maintain the client's confidential information. So, David, I'll I'll jump in. I, I think, you know, we have time, so I think it's worthwhile to sort of go through each of these responses. And I have seen some of the answers. It seems like uh, a few people have perhaps guessed the right one. But um, starting at A, reject the client's proposal. In, out, in my thought, um, and David, please tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> in my thought, um, rejecting the client's proposal right away before you've looked at the program, before you've considered whether it is usable within the bounds of your ethical obligations as an attorney, just seems hasty. Um, so I wouldn't choose A right away. For the same reasons, I wouldn't choose B, because even if it is the most useful program in the world, if you're not able to use it um, in a way that comports with your ethical obligations as an attorney practicing law, then you can't use it. So um, it seems like B is easy to strike right away. Agreed. C, yes. So C, counter the client's proposal with the, prov with the proviso it, that you'll do it at the client's cost. Um, that one made me chuckle because <laughs> um, it's always nice when you can shift a burden, uh, especially the burden of cost for one of these programs. But um, it doesn't matter who's paying for it if it's not something you can use within, your ethic within the ethical rules. So I would strike that immediately as well because at, even though at first glance it, it seems somewhat appealing, um, you know, and, and for all you know, the client might, this tech-savvy CFO or CEO might come back to you and say, yeah, I'll pay for it. Listen, of course, just use it. Um, you can't use it if it's not ethical, if you can't do so ethically. So I would strike C as well. I agree with that as well. Great. Um, okay, we're on the same page. D, counter the client's proposal, um, but say, but not in the event the firm's IT professionals determine the GWIZ platform poses risks to the firm's operating system. See, and the audience doesn't know this, but David really likes to give like half credit answers, <laughs> answers that have some element of, of uh, truth and correctness, but also are wrong. So th I think this question falls into that area, David. I, th I think it's certainly useful to consider that, um, you know, your IT professionals need to know whether or not a program poses risks to the firm's operating systems, but that's not the only thing you need to be worried about. You know, as you discussed, uh, we have con major concerns with, um, with confidentiality, there are concerns with accuracy, with candor. Um, there's concerns with, um, with any number of things that really don't have to do um, solely with the firm's operating system. So I, I don't think D is the right answer either. So that brings me to E, which is the answer that you proposed as a compromise counter the client's proposal by saying in connection with its due diligence functions for the client, the firm will explore the benefits and the risks of utilizing AI software of its own choosing. I think that's the right answer. It has to be, right? Because um, you can't let your client dictate how you practice law, especially because it has to be within um, the contours of the rules of professional ethics. So you have to have some element of independence and freedom in choosing the best, most ethical way for you to competently serve your client. And by saying this, you're saying, listen, I agree that an AI program could be very helpful. We just don't know. So why don't you let me look into it and see if it's something that we can use that will um, not only help you, but that I can ethically use as your lawyer 
Um, and then we'll take it from there. I think so, so, David, my answer, and I think it looked like a number of our audience members agree, is that E is the correct answer. So what do you think? I think I agree with your analysis completely. I think E is the best answer. D gets half credit, but for the reasons you suggested, I'd say that D is, the, is not as prudent a response, not so much from a risk management standpoint, but from a client relations standpoint. You're really trying to essentially blow off the client without really coming to grips with what the client wants, and it's bound to leave a bad taste in the client's mouth. By contrast, as you suggest, E is a more tactful way of dealing with the customer's the client's request, and it gives the firm, but at the same time, gives the firm maximum flexibility to explore the most important thing, which is the risks of just installing in a in the firm's own operating system a program that's untested, untried, and uh, could pose risks independently of the services being provided to the client, but could pose, for example, risks of malware for the entire the firm's entire operating system. So, I think that is probably the best answer. Now, I noticed that some of the on one of the audience members' queries was about how about just asking the client for a broad indemnification agreement. The risk there is the ethical prohibition on asking clients for hold harmless or waiver of claims against the firm. There is an outright prohibition, as many of you know, against asking, even asking clients to provide a kind of wholesale waiver of the right to assert a legal malpractice action. Indemnification comes pretty close, and I would say comes too close for comfort. Certainly, if you're going to push the idea of asking a client for indemnification provision in this context, you would certainly need at a minimum to advise the client in writing that it had the right to get its independent have the right to have independent counsel to review the indemnification proposal. But my instinct is to stay away for it from it. It's more trouble than it's worth. The better approach, both from a customer relations and a risk management standpoint, is to try to meet the client halfway and at least explore the benefits and risks of using AI for um, using AI software of the firm's own choosing. That may placate the client, even though the client was initially jazzed by this using this one vendor. I also noticed, David, I noticed someone typed a really quick question in about what do you do when the client buys the program anyway and decides to use it on their own? Um, I mean, I can't imagine ever having a client who thinks that they know better than we do on how to do something. Can you, David? I mean, that just sounds insane. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, right. that was satire. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, if that happens, and, you know, your client is certainly allowed to do whatever they want to do, but it's always helpful to remind your client that they've hired you because you are good at your job. You're great at your job. You know how to do it. And an AI program is not a lawyer. Um, if they choose to use it, first of all, they can look up and do whatever they want on the program, but they can't insist on you using it when you've said you, it's not ethical. Say you've gone through it, you've determined that you're not able to use it ethically as we've described in this hour. Um, and you've decided that it's not the best program and it's, it's not the right program for right now. If the client insists on it, um, you can always part ways with your client. I mean, that's not necessarily the most attractive option, but you, I certainly would not risk my professional bar license because a client insisted on using an unethical um, or uh, an AI program that exposed me to an, and uh, their company to numerous uh, risk uh, risks with regard to yeah, other, ethical I, liability. Go ahead. I'd say the, the other aspect is not limited to technology. Whenever a client in any engagement insists on carving out part of the task to perform itself, the obvious risk management 
response to that is a clearly worded letter that warns the client in very precise terms that to the extent it's going to perform a, a certain task, the firm, it's got to be clearly understood that the firm will not be involved and that the client has directed it. A very self-serving letter to clearly delineate which task will be performed by the client, which task will be performed by the firm. And as Dana suggests, like many demands from clients, whether it's technologic, technology related or not, there, can, there comes a tipping point where it's not worth it to the firm's um, reputation and tolerance for risk to accede to the client's uh, demands. And then the, the firm's option there is to politely tell the client to go elsewhere. So I think that covers um, this hypothetical and the permutations. There have been some very thoughtful um, comments and questions posted at IC. Um, Dana's right. I give half credit for some answers. And this is obviously a gray area that we're going to see, as I say, play out, I think, increasingly as clients start seeing the obvious benefit in cost savings by use of gener AI generative programs really in lieu of uh, uh, paralegals and other staff members. So the savings should be um, something that clients at least are going to start perceiving can be achieved through use of AI. So now I think we'll turn to the question portion of our program. Yes, thank David, you I just so want to Oh, Erin, do you mind sorry, if I Dana. jump in really quickly? Yeah. No. Um, I noticed uh, someone earlier had asked for the ethics opinion from Florida. Um, it's 24-1, but I also will say that a number of states around the country are starting to issue reports and form task forces and issue informal advisory opinions on precisely this topic, on guiding the lawyers that practice in their states as to how to use AI in their practices. So I know I'm looking at one right now. Um, an interim report to the State Bar of Texas Board of Governors from the Task Force for Responsible AI and the Law. So Texas has a good one as well. Um, but if you go to Google and you just look for um, advisory ethics opinions or um, advisory reports on the use of AI, you should be able to find some really great resources um, with more specific. And as David began today, where this is, we have a short amount of time, so this is a very high-level presentation. But um, these, those resources might be able to provide you with more specific recommendations on any um, particular questions you might have. Sorry, that's, I just wanted to throw that out there. No, that was very helpful. Thank you, David and Dana, both for such an informative presentation, which is undoubtedly on the hottest topic right now in the legal arena. So we appreciate you sharing your expertise today. What should I do if an AI vendor will not provide me with adequate assurances that it will not use the client-related information my firm provides via the firm's input queries and prompts for other customers. Yeah, my view is that's a non-starter. You can't use the vendor. Great. Um, another question that came in, my AI vendor does not permit me, like Westlaw does, to allocate charges incurred to specific client matters. Can I take the vendor's monthly invoice and prorate the charges to pass along to each client for whom I used the service? Yeah, so this is a dilemma we faced in the pre-AI period, in the early days of Westlaw, the early days of Lexis, and even in the, and in the early days of cloud computing and even in outsourcing of uh, electronic discovery to outside vendors. Um, the ethics uh, gurus, disciplinary authorities, and ethics opinion writers have been very critical of firms that attempt to calculate charges by prorating. If the vendor won't provide uh, an allocable, a way to allocate charges between and among specific client projects, there's no, uh, the law firm really can't do a kind of uh, estimate of um, breaking down the charges. And unfortunately, what most of the ethics authorities have concluded is 
If that's the case, the firm has to bear the cost and just consider it a fixed cost, a fixed operating cost. Hopefully, the vendors will start uh, comply uh, will start permitting uh, charges to be alloc charges to be allocated to specific client projects. Great, thanks, David. Um, another question that came in. My firm is using a litigation-related AI platform to assist in analyzing vast amounts of ESI that we receive in response to discovery requests. Can I rely on the AI-generated summaries, or do I need to have a lawyer independently verify the accuracy of each abstract? So this is going to be one of those really rubber-meets-the-road moments for AI's use in, in the specific task of litigation document management. There's going to be a temptation as the, uh, the, analysis is, the analyses that the AI program provides in summarizing, abstracting, um, describing the uh, discovery materials to rely on it. But I think, the, as Dana suggested before, this is an instance where the human element really does have to get involved. You can think of certain nuances in, for example, e email communications between parties. The lawyer, the human being, knows the players, knows their relationship, has taken depositions and sort of has the sense of the demeanor and the background. The AI genie really doesn't know any of that. So there's a certain human nuance that really can't be replicated even though at first glance, as Dana alluded to before, it is somewhat astounding how much interpretive uh, description the AI programs can provide. So I would say this one is going to be one where firms are going to have to feel their way. But certainly, like with so many aspects we discussed today, uh, it's a mistake to blindly or impulsively impulsively rely in the first instance on what the AI program spits out in response to a query. Great. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, my firm's private investigator has recently provided me with digital photos of the allegedly injured plaintiff water skiing on vacation. The investigator says she found them by search of social media accounts. Is it possible the photos have been manipulated or even fabricated by an AI tool? Is this something that I need to confirm? Yes. So I'll, uh, yeah, I was going to jump in. Go too. ahead. Yeah, so go the ahead, answer please. is yes. Um, you know, the world of authentication of social media is, um, is ever expanding. And so <clears throat> I think one of the things we're going to be seeing now is claims that. Um, photos that have been taken from social media are just made up. Um, and I think even sometimes people who post pictures on social media of themselves are using AI to create them. I think we've probably all seen that on Facebook and Instagram and, and other um, social media platforms. Um, it just it reminded me of a recent, art, of a recent headline I saw. Um, <laughs> I'll just read the... the, the that it's from the Daily Mail, so take it with a grain of salt. But it says, Trump takes a nine iron to AI. Ex-president slams despicable people, making him appear fat in golf photos hours after he was hit with a $355 million fine. It turns out, so he claimed that AI was used to give him a pot belly in pictures of him playing golf. And it turns out it, they were just Photoshopped images of John Daly uh, from a picture in 2017 taken. So there's a little bit of humor there, but um, I think we're seeing this across we're seeing this across the country. Everyone's using it. AI is being used to um, to manipulate and create photos. Um, AI is even being used to create sound bits of uh, of things that people are alleged to have said but haven't said, uh, just taken from snippets of their voice in other conversations, recorded conversations. So. Um, I think the short answer to this is yes, you, you are going to have to, in, moving forward, think about um, how you are going to prove that images are accurate as opposed to manipulated. And this is probably going to have to be done through the use of expert, an expert testimony. So um, 
Well, thank you. At this point, we are out of time for further questions, and that concludes today's event. And on behalf of Attorney Protective, I would like to thank all of you for joining us for today's webinar. And I would also like to thank our speakers, David and Dana. So thank you so much, and have a great day.